This is probably my most anticipated live video blog to date. I have a comedy guru, legendary doorman from the Comedy Store in Hollywood, California, and author of the book Stand Up Decoded, fresh from his appearance in the documentary, I Am Sam Kennison. It's Lou Deck. And before I bring him on, I just want to give a shout out to Keith and Jasper Jack and Greg and Mike Lee. What's up, Mike? How you doing, man? Guys, do me a favor and hit the share button right now. Mike, hit the share button because this is going to be a great fucking interview with uh, old old veteran, old pro, Lou Deck. He's going to give a lot of great insight into the world of comedy, the world of show business. And of course, before I get to that, I got to promote my stuff. Otherwise, Lou would probably come on and leave a comment himself. Dude, you got to promote your dates. You got to promote your dates. So very quickly, to all my Wisconsin friends, fans, and followers, I will be in Portage this Friday night at Polk's Pub. I'll put the information in the uh, video description up above. And then Saturday, I go to Briggsville, Wisconsin, not too far away from Portage, for a show at Foxy's Bar for a uh, happy hour comedy hour, 5 o'clock show. That's going to be interesting and fun. We've got a lot of people, man. Tim, thank you. Willie Farrell. Willie Farrell is here. Uh, leave me some questions. Leave me some comments. I'll be sure to pass them along to Lou. Lou Deck, man, calling in from Hollywood, California. What's going on, brother? Hi, dear dog. Nice to be part of the 420 report. Sometimes it's uh, Fox News is so oppressive you have to go counterculture. I go 420. Nice to see you, pal. <laughs> nice to be here. Well, thank you, man. And, you know, I've been following your stuff since I think we got linked up in a comedy forum here on Facebook. And you've always got great advice. It's just fundamental principles that you have a lot of that in your book, which I was reading, Stand Up Decoded. But I got to do it's more it's less of a how to man manual, and more like a fucking manifesto. What was the inspiration to put all that together? Um, I came up to her in 97. Uh, to L.A. Um, um, I live in Hollywood. Uh, I'm not in show business. I'm just here for the frustration. <laughs> so uh, having some downtime for the first time in many, many years, I made a point to you know start writing heavily. And then I did a 50-joke newsletter every week for 100 weeks called Poor Lou's Almanac, kind of after my hero, Ben Franklin, and uh, poor Richard's almanac, and it was basically jokes on any subject. I had seen a old compatriot improviser comedy teacher here in L.A., and that he was teaching joke writing, and I went to his class to see what he was teaching, and he was good, but I don't use that. I came home and started writing, and then I was selling the newsletter for 10 bucks each to radio stations, uh, guys that I knew on tour and letting them either say it was their joke or read my stuff. Mm, right on. Got some advantages from that, and somebody called me up and said, you should do an internet radio show. Uh, after 14 of those, the guy nominated us for a Peabody Award, and it blew me away. And then they changed the internet radio. So his company died, and I quit doing it. But I started taking that back out on tour, and doing a topical newscast in the middle of my show. I saw that in a video that you had sent to me where you had the DJ interrupt you in the middle of the bit and say, hey, Lou, it's time to do that radio spot. Are you ready? And then you, wh yeah. what was the inspiration behind that? Because I've never really seen that before in live stand-up. Um, <laughs> uh, after I got back to L.A. in 97, Sobel, that is to say Tom Sobel, uh, artist uh, from Louisville, Kentucky, the only and last honest booking agent in the world. Um, <laughs> close friend of mine booked me for t uh, six years with Ollie and then for 20 after that. Had something going in L.A. One of his people was starting a management thing. He's hooked up with a big DJ in L.A. who does something called the 5 O'Clock Funnies on FM radio at 5 o'clock every day. And he made it real Several people real big, including Tim Allen before TV, Drew Carey, George Lopez. And this man is running a Friday night comedy show somewhere and messing it up con continually. Would I drop by and help him get his show together? Because I used to do this at the comedy store. Suddenly now, all the comics in L.A. know me because I got a paid gig. 
and it was nice to be back in town, but because of that, he wanted to do an upload from a live show. I picked Tom's Home Club in Louisville, and we actually uploaded it at the same time I did it live, because I'd been working on the, the routine for four or five days. And we did streaming before there was streaming. Very cool. Got it? Yeah. Uh, well, I've done better shows, but I've rarely looked happier. <laughs> but that show in particular was what I chose to be the last chapter of my book, Stand Up Decoded. I take every joke I do and explain why I did it. And here's why my show lays out this way. Yeah, that's the video you sent to me. It was like a commentary on it. You know, if you watch actors do commentary on the Oh, DVD. that was the last chapter of the book two and a half years ago. And I asked them and nobody had the capacity to let me combine the, the printed word with the video. Mm. This year, this is last year, my techno guy, his name is Al Bomani, and mentioned in that article about Kennison. Uh, movie because I hired him to take the pictures and he went on set with me that day and to show you how things work he got along so well with the director that toward the premiere time the director calls me and says can I hire him to host the question answer period after the movie how'd that go it's who you know it's how you act it's when you're at the moment mm -hmm. right thing people remember you and so my friend, not an experienced comic per se, leaped to the top of a 50-person list because the guy had met him. And he did a great job. He had, um, you know who Ron Jeremy is? Of course. <laughs> okay, so he had Ron Jeremy at one end of the panel and Corey Feldman at the other end. And it was wild having nine people answer questions about Kennison's life. And he did great, but suddenly now his status went up so big because he took a gig for me to take pictures. Oh, right on. So it's very strange. I got many breaks in early day Hollywood because they knew I was doing the video at the store. That's what you said. You said that that's how you got my, in. Uh, timeline, Robin Williams singing a Rasta song, a reggae song called Quaalude Vibrations that I own the only copy of in the world. That's how crazy the old days were. <laughs> they said, Lou, go ahead and do it. And then when I left, she said, get rid of all of it. I did, right into my storage locker. Nice. And what, what are your plans? Your own YouTube oh. channel? You could probably do your own comedy channel with vintage uh, footage from back in those days. Yes. The, they actually used in the Kennison movie a, one of the comedy store productions. It was when she, Mitzi was having the big bands in. We had Buddy Rich host the stand-up show with his orchestra. And turns out the front major D Dorman was Sam Kennison. So we got a still shot of, of Sam when he was nothing. Was Dorman like the rest of us. Starting out as a Dorman, just like everybody else. Willie oh, Farrell there, says... There are comics in their comedy store, Dorman. Make no mistake about it. When she picks you, you get what 10 people in the country get. So when she picked me, I was very happy. I stayed seven, eight years, and I wouldn't have left if Ali hadn't asked me to go on tour with him. Mm. Ali Joe Prater, the greatest comic I ever saw. Uh, and what, what made Ali Joe the greatest comic you ever saw? He was a good old boy that made people laugh and didn't take no crap. <laughs> After a while, he learned to talk in joke formula. Yeah. And it was the most powerful... A uh, comic I ever saw. I mean, uh, I'm a Richard Pryor and Robin Williams fan from up close, and they could not come close to doing what Ali Joe did night after night. Now, Robin's great in, in Carnegie Hall. We come down to Paducah, Kentucky with me. Mm. And, then, and, and then the next day, Nashville, and then the next day, Knoxville. They, there are star acts that never work hard. Ali worked every night. He was out there doing and, those and, gigs. And a Can thousand you? shows, never saw him bomb, never saw him give up. Never saw him bomb. Now, he's taking some considerable rap about stealing jokes, and I'm not going to say that's untrue. But once I got with him, we, you know, I'm a mechanic, mm -hmm. and which is what I'd like to do with you, by the way. We took Ali Joe Prater's act, uh, the saloon act, and uh, we ordered it up like it was a TV set, and 30 TV sets. Mm-hmm. 
then he could decide whether to do part three first or part 19 first or the set. And then after a while, it was just, it would blow people away. I learned he, I watched him for two years and said, how do you do that? And finally, I figured out something he didn't know he was doing. He would break timing and make him choke on a certain joke every night. But I had to watch it for the longest time to understand what he was doing it was a linguistic public speaking trick, and it was funny. How how long did it take for you to put together that formula? You mentioned it in Stand Up Decoded. There's definitely a joke writing formula, and it's oh. it's not just subject to inspiration. People, it's a repeatable process, just like working in a factory job. You just got to clock in, do the fucking work, and you can come up with gobs and gobs and gobs of material. You know, who knows what will hit out of all that, but there's definitely a joke writing formula, and you do a really good job of breaking it down in the book, I think. Well, uh, after 42 years of stand-up, if I want to do anything now, it's quantify the lessons I learned. I keep looking at my career because I'm first, let's clarify, I'm an assessed Virgo with an orderly list complex. Mm. My socks and underwear drawer are perfectly straight. I traveled in a tour van for 12 years with three sets of clothes, two sets of golf clubs, and a sleep pad. If you don't have your crap together, you're not going to be that good on stage. So it became a matter of a scientific thing. Did I say it right tonight? I think it's funny. They were, I wouldn't be saying it, but, you know, there's a whole process on trying things out. But in the act, I'm from real show business where they want to know they can count on you. And if they don't know what you're going to do and you don't know what you're going to do, you're simply not going to be in that movie or TV show. Mm, they only yeah, hire people sure. to do that. So at some point, sitting in the back hall of the comedy store, the talent coordinator of The Tonight Show would come in and watch comics and stand there and curse them for the mistakes they were making not getting ready for TV. Those that listened got The Tonight Show, including one of my best friends, Argus Hamilton, and after his first Tonight Show to organize, you know, of course, you get your big break, you go do your best five. Mm -hmm. Argus did, did well. They, they invited you back a month later, and we had to prepare the set according to the rules of the talent coordinator who knew what Johnny liked. Part of that was getting rid of excess words, how long between the laughs. And out of that generation, that phrase was born, laughs per minute. What do you think of that? I'm, I'm a firm believer. I have my show on Stand Up Decoded that supports this. is 26 minutes and 100 laughs. I work fast. I keep going. And that regardless of the weight of any one joke, I know in the end I can bring the crowd home. Yeah, the aggregate of the well, whole thing. Well, I'm a laughter guy. I, I'm, uh, let's clarify. First, uh, comics are not regular people, right? Not at all. We're all screwed up in the head some way. Not, a, not on the slightest. Second, either you're talented or you're skilled. Right? I'm not talented. <laughs> I had to learn to be skilled. <laughs> Nobody's ever going to hurt my feelings in Hollywood saying, you bum, you, you no talent, some of it. I go, you're right, but I'm one of the most skilled guys you'll ever meet. I've often described what I learned in the hall at the back comedy store is... Uh, in NASCAR, they have a, a, a bunch of people waiting in the pits to fix the car. The yeah. guy sitting at the head of the tent is the crew chief. He knows how to set up a car. Well, I found out how to set up a stand-up act. Mm. So I can say to any stand-up, and recently I made the mistake of saying to Judd Apatow, if you want some help with your stand-up, I can help. <laughs> but the truth is, I know what the nuts and bolts are. I know how to reduce lab, uh, excess words and increase your LPMs. And I, oh, let me make another determination. There are two kinds of comics. There are joke comics and there are attitude comics. For purposes of this, I'll say Jay Leno is a joke comic. Dave Letterman is an attitude comic. What's the difference? Okay, one is less punchlines from attitude guys. Um, for every attitude guy that makes it, it takes 50. For every joke guy that makes it, it takes about 14. What do you mean by that? that? Longer. Oh, okay. Just, do you know how long it took Andrew Dice Clay to get anywhere? Do you know how long it took Sam to get anywhere? They were added, the two original attitude guys of my generation. Right. But only, only one of them break through every 10 years. 
right? Attitude gotta comics. decide what you want to do. If you want to be you, go into therapy. If you want to be a showbiz <laughs> act, do what the crowd likes. Right. Can you do both? Uh, I think some artists can, and it's like being in the zone on a basketball court. Mm-hmm. Any, any yeah, practitioner will hit the zone from time to time because you know what you're doing. But to maintain it every show, I think that takes a special person of which I'm not. I yeah. Can funny. I can be funny every night anywhere on the planet. Can I be special every night? Probably not. I have to be me. I don't put on. I play me as a character. Right. I got you. Laugh, I take it really personally. And when they do, I really like it. You know, I always say I could get by just on 20, 20 minutes just on attitude without having any prepared material at all. And I can, and I think crowds really do like that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that I can, uh, I'm going to deliver my A game when I'm doing that. I can get by. And, you know, a lot of times my getting by is sometimes, you know, with after 20 years in, it looks like, uh, you know, a newbie delivering a polished set my getting by still completely eclipses that just through sheer experience and attitude. But I think you got to have both. And some of the problems with someone who is a talent as opposed to someone who is skilled, I think they've gotten by so long on their talent that then they've never thought to develop the skill. So if you can get by on natural talent or attitude, but then also combine the skill and the fundamentals and the practices and principles like what you talk about in your book, I think you could be a fucking juggernaut. I don't know if anybody out there is like that or if anybody would uh, fall into that category for you that you know of or have worked with throughout the years, but if there's somebody that could do both, that'd be like the Luke Skywalker of comedy. Well, it's everybody plays the skills they have. And whatever charisma or, or talent they have, uh, my talent, if I admit to having any, is in keeping track of organizational. I've always said stand-up to me is a scientific experiment. It's a cause and effect. I cause them to laugh, they laugh. That's the effect. If I didn't cause them to laugh, then I've screwed up the effect. I mean, I screwed it up. Yeah. It's not their fault. It's my fault. Right. Well, after many thousands of tries with certain jokes, certain crowds, certain times of the night, uh, you learn what to do. So I think what makes you so great is that you claim you don't have much, but you have your, your showmanship is not to be questioned because look where you work. 20% of your audience is armed. <laughs> so you've got to deliver. That's what I learned, you know, for all the places, um, do you remember the movie Urban Cowboy? Absolutely. <laughs> okay, it's an inspiration. Versus, this is a bar east of Houston called Mickey Gillies. In my first 20 shows, I performed there on nights they weren't riding the bulls. Before <laughs> the movie. Just learning to get on takes courage beyond belief. Staying on just takes stubbornness. Agreed. <laughs> I had a something the other day. Uh, I'm, I'm working on my second book. It's going to be from comedy, from stand up hell to comedy heaven, mm -hmm. which are two paintings uh, uh, um, Nikki Shane artists stand up uh, have done and sit in my office, and I sit between them every day. But this is going to be less lessony and more uh, stories I learned. And that at some point you have to say, what were you doing? That, that happened, and something good came. So I'm looking at every little corner I turned in my life and finding why. I like that. First, the luckiest guy I ever met. They called me to do the Kennison movie, and I said, no, I'm <laughs> mad at Sam. <laughs> and they called me back again, and they called me back again. So uh, I did it, but then it turns out to be, God, I've got the uh, end-up students in Nigeria that heard about it. Right on. Yeah, man. It's And I can't wait to see it. If I could ever get it myself a copy of it, I don't know where it's available, but uh, I've seen, I've heard nothing but good reviews. Well, they have printed and made the DVDs already because they sent me one. Um, first, Google it. Uh, second, it's going to come back. I think what they're, they're looking for a couple of theater releases to qualify for awards. Right. 
and then it will it will be back on. Did you know Spike TV ended and is now Paramount TV? Yeah, that's what I heard. I don't have cable, so I don't keep up too much with it. I think I just heard that through the article you sent me. Just on. You still there? Yeah, I'm sorry. Um, um, I missed the last thing you said. Tell me again. I said I don't have cable TV, so I think I just found out about the Spike TV thing. Okay. Going Knowing the, the way the Internet works, I bet somebody's selling it somewhere. If not, yeah. um, I'll see what I can do. Hey, and we're almost at 20 minutes. You've graciously given me so much of your time, and I can't wait to do this again someday if you'd ever agree to it. Well, you know? It's so I'm fun. sorry to talk so much. We'll do this again, and you can talk more. <laughs> no, dude, I was taking notes. Uh, but the question that came in from Willie Farrell, do you know Willie Farrell? Uh, the name is familiar to me. A, uh, one of my, Another one of my original inspirations from back in the day, he gave me positive encouragement when no other headliner was doing that. They were all telling me to get out of the business. It's the early 90s. Okay. Comedy club is dying. He's like, no, kid, you got a goofy look. You'll do just fine. But he put in a question. He wants to know who all the comics are in the comic store basketball photo. He sees Letterman and hey, J.J. Like, Walker. How you doing, buddy? Um, from the left on top, David Letterman. Next, Tim Reed. Next, Lou Deck. Next, Roger Bear. Next, Daryl Igus. Next, Jimmy J.J. Walker. Next, Johnny Witherspoon. And boy, he's been in 30 movies. Uh, I will not mention the name that's next to him. <laughs> uh, on the bottom on the left in front of Letterman is my partner, Jimmy Heck. At the time, we were Heck and Dak. Next to that is Joe Restivo. Next to that is Daryl and Dwayne Mooney, Paul Mooney's twin sons. Not only pretty funny, but the best two guards I ever played basketball with in 30 years. They're nice. Fantastic. They're in a movie called uh, The Fish That Saved Pittsburgh. In the very middle of the picture... Uh, Corky Hubbard, uh, a dead person, uh, used to do stand-up, but he's never played on the team, just put him in the picture. Next to that is Roger, um, Roger Bear. I said the tall guy at the top was Roger Van Horn. And the next to Roger Bear is, uh, Jimmy O'Brien. Jimmy O'Brien from O'Brien and Severa and O'Brien and Valdez, and now Jimmy O'Brien. The comedy store basketball team. Uh, there was a league in Hollywood where the production shows would play softball. And then a year or two later, the comedy store put a team in, and I didn't go. Uh, the next year, they said, let's get a basketball team together and wanted comedy store sponsorship. And she said, do you play? I said, yes. I play with them all the time. She said, go organize it. So I got to be on the team. And then it turns out I was the only one that wanted to rebound. I made the starting lineup, and I'm an unknown. <laughs> in the last game we played on the second night of the great comedy strike they had scheduled a celebrity basketball game at halftime at lakers at a laker game all right we got to play in the forum and the next night they're yelling at me from across the uh picket line at the great comedy strike from teammates to I, enemies I, in less than 24 <laughs> hours Holy shit. Anyhow, Letterman um, was on the team and could shoot but wouldn't play defense, so he didn't get a lot of time. But it was more <laughs> of a hang-around thing with him and the, the name I won't mention from the strike, who's a member of W. Maxwell Group. Oh, let's talk about that. It's like Lo Lord Voldemort. W. Maxwell Group is a stand-up uh, comedy group on Facebook and uh, is starting to provide some of the best ever recorded information about stand-up to be in that group and be part uh, of the advisory crew is the nicest thing that has happened to me in two years on Facebook. Right on, man. Until today, when you're able to be on the 420 report with the mighty Jerdoc. Well, I got to say, <laughs> I'm going to go back and listen to it when you post it. I hope I didn't talk too much, but thanks for having me. No, thank you, man. It was my favorite one because not only did I get some wisdom from a true legend in the comedy business, the one and only Lou Deck, who did not actually come on board at the comedy store as a doorman, but actually the guy who's in charge of video. A very unique way to get your foot in the door somewhere. I like how you came in different than everybody else, and that's how you paved your own path. Uh, well, I became a doorman afterwards to make more money. Yeah, there you go. I'm giving me jobs I don't drink. <laughs> and uh, everybody that had the jobs in front of me were all comics would get drunk and get fired. So I got like five jobs in three years. But, and this was, that's awesome. <laughs> and then you got to go on tour with Ollie Joe. 
Ollie Joe Prater. Um, Ollie and, Joe's the guy that gave me my first job in Hollywood at the Comedy Store Westwood. So we were lifelong pals. He's also got a whole lot of CDs and albums out on the Laughing Hyena label, which you can find those still at truck stops nationwide, along with my CD, my original CD that we recorded at the in Columbus, Georgia, at the Comedy Loft there back in 2005. is called Domesticated Party Animals. So uh, there's just a little bit of Jared Dog trivia for you. I don't know if my CD is still available at truck stops or not, but I know Ollie Joe Prater's is. He got volume after volume after volume. So, dude, I learned a lot, man. And this is my favorite video blog, 420 Report, yet, because you did get to do most of the talking. I just got here to sit here and listen and learn. We got a lot of fun people that tuned in and, and watched and commented and thank all you guys. Thank you, Willie, for the question. And Let me ask else. you one thing before you go. Yeah, what's up? We can keep Pretty going, too, if you want. Oh, well, uh, no, I just uh, let me redirect out of blue in the Jared Dog. Here. Mm-hmm. I'm a fan of your show because you keep working. I'm a firm believer the more times you do something, the better you get at it. This show has gotten better and better and better. What you're actually learning to do is your own show on NBC at 3 a.m. So <laughs> keep doing what you're doing. Bring some more material and a little more funny. But what you're doing is teaching yourself how to do it. That's my favorite thing about comedy. You can teach yourself to do it. And that includes be happy. So I think you found a way to make yourself happy. I have. Let's help the people listening and the people that learn. Make yourself happy because nobody else is going to do it for you. If I can't do it for myself, I listen to the 420 report. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I love it. That's actually a really good way to wrap this up. And thank you guys right now who is still on the line watching. Um, I'll be back tomorrow, probably a throwback Thursday. Who knows what I'll come up with for tomorrow. Probably something to rant and rave about, you know, attitude comic and all. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lou, thank you, man. Once again, you gave me way more than the 20 minutes that you had promised, and I really appreciate it, dude. I can't say that more. I can't say that Did you see enough. the comment from Chip Sobel? I did. Does he even have 20? <laughs> yes, well. How dare you, Chip? Well, I can't, he, I can't go near him. Without taking a shot and giving a shot, we have a $2 bill war going on for almost 25 years. And when I was in Louisville for Tom's birthday in August last, as I got on the plane, some airline officials stopped them from closing the door to walk on and ask where I was and hand me an envelope. And Chip nailed me with a $2 bill <laughs> and flying out of town. Got me. Nice. Score is four to two, and I got to get him back. If you're near <laughs> Louisville, I'll pay you good money to slip him a $2 bill. We just had a whole bunch of likes and loves go across the screen. I'm pretty sure that's Chip right now. So there you have it. Funny. Shout out to Chip. Funny. Sobel. So what happened was I'm in Memphis. Uh, they open a new club. They bring in the Harry Blackstone Jr. to open a comedy club, and just me and him, and me to set him up, and they paid him so much they closed after the first weekend and so they didn't have enough money to pay me they gave me a bucket full of quarters which i drove straight <laughs> to louisville sat on tom's desk who handed it to chip and had to go to the bank and chip bought me back two hundred dollars in two dollar bills two days later his car breaks down because it turns out there's a two dollar bill inside his carburetor and the game is afoot <laughs> I'm sitting next to my my desk. I haven't seen him since August, and I have ten two dollar bills here. If I hear he's in the state, I'll pay money to have somebody stash one on him. At any rate, nice. it's a crazy life. What I have, Jared Ock, Here's what I've learned in the last three years that is so important. I wrote that book, and I had to realize what I'd been through and how lucky I was, and where the decisions turned. That writing the book was better for me than all of the stand-up comedy. So my lesson to you is, sir, write a fucking book. Mm. Like I did. I wrote short stories and then put a thread between with comedy lessons. It doesn't all have to be your history. It just write what happened to you. You've been through so fucking much. Mm -hmm. you got a book, bro. And once you got a book, you might have a movie. Don't tell nobody. But I prefer to do as the next Ali Joe Prater. Oh, thanks, man. That's just our that's just our secret between us right now. Nobody else is watching. Not till I want to doom you. <laughs> <laughs> okay.
Okay, you go do what you got to do. I'll do the same here. It was an honor and a privilege, my friend. Thank you. Yeah, likewise, Lou. Thank you, man. And thank you for watching. I'll be back tomorrow at 420 p.m. or as close as possible. In the meantime, dog bless America. Dog. And Semper Funny. <laughs>